I'd like to read for us from 1 Peter chapter 1, verses 3 through, I'll read to verse 9. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In his great mercy, he has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead and into an inheritance that can never perish, spoil, or fade, kept in heaven for you, who through faith are shielded by God's power until the coming of the salvation that is ready to be revealed in the last time. In this you greatly rejoice, though now for a little while you may have had to suffer griefs, grief in all kinds of trials. These have come so that your faith of greater worth than gold, which perishes even though refined by fire, may be proved genuine and may result in praise, glory, and honor when Jesus Christ is revealed. Though you have not seen him, you love him. And even though you do not see him now, you believe in him and are filled with an inexpressible and glorious joy. For you are receiving the goal of your faith, the salvation of your souls. We've been looking at Acts and what God is doing through Peter. And Peter writes these words to the churches long ago. But the message has not changed. In Jesus Christ, we find salvation. When we look to him through faith, through believing in him, we are filled with joy. A joy that transcends whatever trials we go through in this life. We have this joy that cannot be taken away from us, knowing that we, uh, we belong to Jesus Christ and we will be his for all eternity. And so let's celebrate and rejoice what God is doing through Jesus Christ. In this service, let's celebrate the salvation available through Jesus Christ our Lord. I'll invite the worship team forward. We'll sing our opening songs, Come People of the Risen King, and after the greeting, the ends of all the earth shall hear this wonderful message that there is salvation in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. Please stand when the music begins to play.
receive a greeting from our God. Grace and peace to you from him who is and who was and who is to come, and from the seven spirits who are before his throne, and from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness, the firstborn from the dead, and the ruler of the kings of the earth. Amen. Continue praising God and celebrating that this wonderful message shall reach the ends of the earth. God invites us into his presence, he invites us to come before him, to open our hearts before him and to confess whatever it is on our hearts that stands between us and him. In Ephesians 3, 14 through 19, we hear Paul speaking this prayer for the Ephesian Christians. For this reason, I kneel before the Father, from whom his whole family in heaven and on earth der derives its name. I pray that out of his glorious riches, he may strengthen you with power through his spirit in your inner being, so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith. And I pray that you, being rooted and established in love, may have power, together with all the saints, to grasp how wide and long and high and deep is the love of Christ, and to know this love that surpasses knowledge, that you may be filled to the measure of all the fullness of God. Paul prays for the Christians he knew and who he was writing to. This prayer, we pray for one another and for ourselves, that we may come to know God through Christ more and more. Let's bow our heads and come to God in prayer. Lord God, our Father, we come before you. Just a small collection of your children, part of your worldwide family, 
your family, Lord, that spans all time, all places, all nations. Lord, we are your children. We carry your family names through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray, Lord, that out of your glorious riches, you may strengthen us. Strengthen us with your power through your Holy Spirit in our most inner beings. Holy Spirit, work in us. Remove whatever stands in the way that keeps us from having a a deeper, more meaningful relationship with you, our God, the one who has created us, the one who seeks to redeem us and restore us through faith in Jesus Christ. Lord Jesus, may you dwell in our hearts through faith in you. May we be rooted and established in your everlasting love. May we be given power as your church to know just how wide and long and high and deep is your love. The love that we see in Jesus Christ, the love that led him to the cross on our sake, for our sake, on our behalf. We know, Lord, through faith in Jesus Christ, all our sins are taken away. We do not need to carry that burden any longer. But we need to come to you in repentance, with true humility, and with honesty, confessing that we need you, Lord Jesus, to save us from our sin, to restore us to the original creation goodness that you, Lord God, made all things. We know in Jesus And through the power of the Spirit, this will be done. And so go go with us as we journey through life, as we face trials and tribulations, that we would always look to you, Lord Jesus, and rely on your finished work on the cross and over the grave. We pray this in your name. Amen. Remain seated as we sing about this love that God shows us through Jesus Christ. Oh, the deep, deep love of Jesus.
Let's confess together what Christians have been confessing throughout the centuries, this wonderful faith in our triune God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Let's say the words of the Apostles' Creed together. I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended to hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended to heaven and is seated at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. And now let's stand together as we sing Holy Spirit, living breath of God. And we need to, we can only journey as Christians in life with the power of the Spirit living within us. Let's stand together and sing.
It's an exciting day. We resume Sunday school again today, and in just a moment, the kids pre-K to grade three will, will exit the sanctuary. They'll go out the back. They won't come to the front. We won't do that for now, the, bl- the blessing. So allow me to lead us in prayer and ask for the Lord's blessing before we turn to God's word here in the sanctuary or in the Sunday school rooms. And after that, the children will be dismissed. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord, for your word. We thank you that whatever our age, you can guide us and you will guide us when we turn to your word, when we study what you have to say to us. Lord, whatever age we're at, whatever stage we are on our journey, will you speak to us in this time? As we read words of scripture written so long ago, may they be words that are new to us this day. Words that draw us closer to you, our Father in heaven, and closer to Jesus Christ, our Lord and Savior, through the power of the Holy Spirit who lives and dwells within each one of your children, no matter our age. So Lord, bless us in this time. Bless the Sunday school children and their teachers too as they go off to study your word there. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, Sunday school kids, pre-K to grade three, you know who you are. Parents, help them out. You guys can head out the back. And then following the service, the older classes will meet after the service behind the sanctuary here. But not the high school kids. You get an extra week off or two. We'll see. And we're going to look at Acts again as we make our way through this wonderful book, this book of history of the early church, Acts chapter 10 we'll look at, I invite you to turn there, page 1710, 1710 in the Pew Bible, if you're going to follow along in the Pew Bible, Acts 10, we'll begin at verse 34, and we'll read to verse 18 of chapter 11. It's a long story. We're looking at it in two last week and this week, so I encourage you to read along, it's because it's especially because it's a long passage. It's always good, though, to have the Bible open in front of you, make sure I'm reading the proper thing and saying the proper thing. Let's begin at verse 34 of Acts chapter 10. Then Peter began to speak. I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts men, people from every nation who fear him and do what is right. You know the message God sent to the people of Israel, telling the good news of peace through Jesus Christ, who is Lord of all. You know what has happened throughout Judea, beginning in Galilee after the baptism that John preached how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and power, and how he went around doing good and healing all who were under the power of the devil, because God was with him. We are witnesses of everything he did in the country of the Jews and in Jerusalem. They killed him by hanging him on a tree. But God raised him from the dead on the third day and caused him to be seen. He was not seen by all the people, but by witnesses whom God had already chosen, by us, who ate and drank with him after he rose from the dead. He commanded us to preach to the people and to testify that he is the one whom God appointed as judge of the living and the dead. All the prophets testify about him, that everyone who believes in him receives forgiveness of sins through his name. While Peter was still speaking these words, the Holy Spirit came on all who heard the message. The circumcised believers who had come with Peter, were astonished that the gift of the Holy Spirit had been poured out even on the Gentiles. For they heard them speaking in tongues and praising God. Then Peter said, Can anyone keep these people from being baptized with water? They have received the Holy Spirit just as we have. So he ordered that they be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ. Then they asked Peter to stay with them for a few days. The apostles And the brothers throughout Judea heard 
that the Gentiles had also had received the word of God. So when Peter went up to Jerusalem, the circumcised believers criticized him and said, You went into the house of uncircumcised men and ate with them. Peter began and explained everything to them precisely as it had happened. I was in the city of Joppa praying, and in a trance I saw a vision. I saw something like a large sheet being let down from heaven by its four corners, and it came down to where I was. I looked into it and saw four-footed animals of the earth, wild beasts, reptiles, and birds of the air. Then I heard a voice telling me, Get up, Peter, kill and eat. I replied, Surely not, Lord. Nothing impure or unclean has ever entered my mouth. The voice spoke from heaven a second time, Do not call anything impure that God has made clean. This happened three times, and then it was all pulled up to heaven again. Right then, three men who had been sent to me from Caesarea stopped at the house where I was staying. The Spirit told me to have no hesitation about going with them. These six brothers also went with me, and we entered the man's house. He told us how he had seen an angel appear in his house and say, Send to Joppa for Simon, who is called Peter. He will bring you a message through which you and all your household will be saved. As I began to speak, the Holy Spirit came on them as he had come on us at the beginning. Then I remembered what the Lord had said. John baptized with water, but you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. So if God gave them the same gift as he gave us, who believed in the Lord Jesus Christ, who was I to think that I could oppose God? When they heard this, they had no further objections and praised God, saying, So then, God has granted even the Gentiles repentance unto life. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. <clears throat> Acts chapter 10 and chapter 11, they tell one story, primarily involving two men. But as we've been seeing, by extension, this story involves all of humanity. And we'll consider the magnitude of this story again today. Cornelius is the first man we are introduced to. He's a Roman soldier, but he's a God-fearing man who prays to God and he cares for his neighbors. Cornelius is visited by an angel. The angel tells him to fetch Peter, and Peter has a message that Cornelius desperately needs to hear. But in actuality, the whole world needs to hear this message. Peter, he's visited by God in a dream. God shows him a sheet with all manner of animals in it. God tells Peter to kill and to eat. Peter resists. As a good Jew, he stays away from anything unclean. God teaches Peter that what God says is clean, no one must call unclean. And that includes people that the Lord calls unto himself. Peter must learn that all people can receive the favor of God if God so chooses. Well, Peter does learn the lesson. For he declares in verse 34, the opening verse of our passage, I now realize how true it is that God does not show favoritism, but accepts from every nation those who fear him and do what is right. This lesson that Peter had to learn, it's not just a lesson for him. For in actuality, all God's people who hold religious prejudices must learn this lesson. Cornelius' story about the angel visitation, it's told four times in these two chapters. Verses 1 through 8, and then in 22 and 23, and then in 30 through 33 of chapter 10, and then again in our passage, verses 13 and 14. Cornelius. He is a Gentile whom God has gotten a hold of. God is claiming Cornelius as his own. And to make Cornelius his child, God uses Peter. Peter's story about the vision of the clean and unclean animals, that's told two times in these chapters. In verses 9 through 19 of chapter 10, Luke recounts the story of Peter's vision. And then in our passage this morning, verses 4 through 11, Peter recounts the vision that he had. And those two accounts, they're almost identical. God transforms a prejudiced, religious bigot into his spokesman to the world. 
So why all this repetition? Luke could have greatly reduced this story, probably could have fit it in within 10 verses. Well, for one reason, the Holy Spirit inspired Luke to write the story this way. Why? Why so much repetition? Well, as we've learned before, we've talked about before in the Bible, repetition equals importance. God is teaching important lessons in this repetitive story. Many commentators say that the story of Cornelius and Peter is one of the most important stories in the New Testament. Some even say that these are the most important chapters in Acts and even in the Bible itself. Well, those are pretty bold claims. Why is this story so important? Well, as we looked at last week, this story is about God meeting the greatest need of every human being. Every person's greatest need is to get back to God. Everyone needs a relationship with God, and that includes people from all times, all places, all, eth all ethnicities. But no one can get back to God. No one can have a life-saving relationship with Him on their own. God must enter people's lives. He must call them back unto Himself. And yet, God's call is not enough to bridge the chasm between himself and his people. There's a message that God's, God uses to bridge this great divide. That message is the gospel of Jesus Christ. The good news of Jesus believed is the only way people can reach God. God delivers that message most often through people whom he's called to himself who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. And so this is one of the most important stories in the Bible, for it reveals how God saves people for all eternity. Peter, we know him quite well. He's a believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. He has saving faith, but he believed that only Jews could have a saving relationship with God. But as verses 34 and 35 show us, God breaks Peter from this prejudice. Right after his confession, Peter does what God prepared and saved him to do. God brought Peter into a saving knowledge and belief of the Lord Jesus Christ so that he could tell others about this Jesus. In verses 36 to 43 of our text, Peter tells the wonderful, glorious good news of Jesus. He shares the gospel. And to whom does Peter proclaim Jesus Christ? To Gentiles. Cornelius and his household. These Gentiles, as I say, represent the world. The people of the world need to hear about Jesus Christ. And God begins by preparing and sending Peter to the world. Peter writes this message about Jesus. It went first to Israel. This message was one of good news, of peace through Jesus Christ. What is this peace? Well, it is peace with God. Sinners are at war with God. Sin is open rebellion against God's word, against God's law. And nothing a sinner can do can restore peace with God. But the gospel declares sinful people can once again find peace with a God who is righteous and just. And this peace comes through Jesus Christ and what Jesus has done. This peace with God is available to all because Jesus is Lord of all. So who is this Jesus, and what has he done? Well, Jesus was a real historical figure who came from the town of Nazareth, Peter lets us know. God empowered Jesus with the Holy Spirit and with power to do miracles at his baptism. God declared that Jesus was his son, the anointed one, the Messiah, the Christ. And as Messiah Christ, Jesus did good. He healed people who were under Satan's power, under the chains, locked under the chains of sin. And then God's anointed one, he was killed by the Jews. They had Jesus hung on a cross. But the story does not end there. The gospel story continues. Jesus did not stay dead. God raised him from death. And Peter writes, many witnesses saw Jesus alive. Those first witnesses were himself and the other disciples. He says, we ate, we drank with this Jesus who was once dead, but is alive again. 
and this risen Jesus, he told us disciples to testify that Jesus is judge of the living and the dead. This Jesus told the disciples to go tell the world that Jesus holds the future of every single person in his hands. Tell the world what God foretold in the Old Testament about Jesus, that it's all true, that everyone who believes in Christ Jesus receives forgiveness of sins through his name. Why is this such good news? Because as I said, everyone stands apart from God on account of their sin. Everyone will be judged guilty on account of their sin. Everyone will face eternal punishment, separation from God, hell, on account of their sin. Ah, but Jesus is the judge. Jesus can reverse the effects of sin. Jesus can provide forgiveness of sins. Jesus is the judge of everyone. And because Jesus is Lord of all, he's God incarnate, Jesus can also be the greatest defender that we all need. He can be the payment of sin for anyone who turns to him. All that anyone has to do is believe in Jesus Christ to receive forgiveness from sin. Believers will be, de will be declared not guilty by the judge of the universe. Jesus brings believers back into relationship with God. And this gospel of salvation through faith in Jesus Christ, it's for the whole world. For Jesus alone can meet the deepest need of every single human being who has or will ever live. The gospel of Jesus is for people of all nations. When people hear and accept the gospel of Jesus Christ, they are reunited with God. We, we read of that in our text, verse 44. While Peter was still speaking the good news of Jesus, the Holy Spirit came upon all who heard the message. Those who heard the message about Jesus Christ and believed, they were filled with God himself, God the Holy Spirit. Those who heard are Cornelius, his household, his family, who he had gathered to hear the message that Peter would bring. To have God dwelling within them is proof that these Gentiles belong to God. To have the Holy Spirit dwell within them shows that God is restoring them unto himself. Salvation comes from believing in Christ Jesus, crucified and risen. Peter declares that these Gentiles have received the Holy Spirit, just like he and the other disciples had on Pentecost. This indwelling Holy Spirit is God's deposit of himself, a deposit that guarantees believers in Jesus Christ are his for all eternity. The Apostle Paul speaks at length on that in his letters. The Jews thought, however, that the Holy Spirit was only for them as God's chosen people. In chapter 11, we read how Peter is challenged by this pre prejudi prejudicial thinking. The circumcised believers, we read, criticize him for having any business to do with Gentiles. The circumcised believers refers to Jews who had become Christians. Peter tells them, about his vision from God of the clean and unclean animals. He tells these Jewish Christians how God declared that what he says is clean, no one must call unclean. That means Gentiles whom God calls and sets apart as his own children, they are clean. They are deemed worthy by God for the Spirit of God to dwell within them. God gave Cornelius and his family the same gift that the apostles received on Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. Sometimes this story is referred to as the Gentile Pentecost. They spoke in tongues as a sign that the Spirit was in them. Peter goes on, he says, he had the new, uh, new Gentile believers baptized. Baptism was the new sign of being included in God's family. The old sign of circumcision, that was discontinued. Peter says, who was I to stand in God's way? And the Jewish Christians thankfully agreed with him. They accepted that even to Gentile, Gentiles, God has granted repentance that leads to life. This repentance that leads to life for any and all people comes through faith 
in Jesus Christ, crucified and risen. What develops by the end of our passage of this story is one growing, multi-ethnic, international church of Jesus Christ. God is gathering people from all nations into his family. This is God's great salvation plan unfolding. And the Holy Spirit inspires Luke to write how God is building his church. How God is preparing people of all nations to hear the gospel of Jesus Christ. And he sends Christians from all nations to these people to preach the gospel about Jesus. Because of what God did here in Acts, the church of Jesus spans all time, all places, all nations. This story centers on the gospel of Jesus Christ. Cornelius and Peter figure, figure large in the story, but its foundation is the gospel. Gentiles and Jews cross, crossing ethnic boundaries, it's meaningless unless the gospel is what unites them as one. No one is more privileged to be saved and to be called a child of God than anyone else. No ethnic group has greater status in God's eyes. In fact, no one on their own is worthy to become a child of God. As I said, all sinners stand guilty before God. It's only because of God's mercy and his grace that a person is saved. Any emphasis that the church puts on ethnic or social distinctives, it's misguided at best. But at its worst, prejudices in the church are anti-gospel. They are anti-God's word. Prejudice in the church is sin. What God calls clean, let no one call unclean. The gospel and the Holy Spirit are for all whom the Lord calls unto himself. The church must not stand in its way. The church is to tell the good news of Jesus to all people. Both Cornelius and Peter prayed to God. They were both seeking God's will for their lives. And the Lord led a God-seeker to a God-proclaimer. Cornelius and his family needed to hear the message of salvation in Christ alone. Peter was given that message, that message that there is indeed salvation through the one named Jesus Christ who was crucified and is now risen. And what a beautiful result was accomplished by the Lord our God. We are heirs of what God did that day between Cornelius and Peter. And so we need to praise the Lord for what he has done, that we, hundreds of years later, may, be, uh, may call ourselves children of God through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. If we are willing, the Lord will use us too, like he used Peter. All we need to do is put Jesus Christ first. The church throughout its history has spent much time, many resources, trying to figure out how best to do missions and to evangelize. God shows us right here in the book of Acts how to do missions. We need to get past ourselves, drop our prejudices, and tell people about Jesus Christ. It's that simple. It's not easy, but it is that simple. Tell people about Jesus. That's the church's mission. That's why God saves us, not only for our own good, but so that we can tell others about Jesus Christ, who is our Lord and Savior. So let's take up that challenge. Let's answer the call of Jesus Christ to his followers to spread the good news that there is life, life eternal, through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. Let's pray. We thank you, Lord Jesus, for, you, for what you have done. We thank you for the gospel message which you have brought to us again this day. The message, Lord, that through your death, through your resurrection, believing in what you have done, we find salvation. We find eternal life because we find God. But in fact, it is you, Lord, God, that is doing the finding. You come and call us. 
For on our own, we would continue to reject you. But you seek us. You prepare our hearts to accept the message of salvation in Christ alone. Lord, as we've heard that message, may we accept it more and more. May you strengthen our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and Holy Spirit who dwells within every believer in Jesus. Would you empower us to spread that good news? It's not easy. At times, we will be rejected just like the early Christians were. And yet, you call us to go forth to spread that good news that in Jesus Christ there is salvation that we do not need to fear meeting our maker, that we do not need to fear the judge of all things, the living and the dead, because he is Jesus. And if our faith is in him, he is our greatest defender. And he will declare us not guilty when we come before you and stand before your presence, God and Father. May this wonderful good news fill our lives with joy, with peace, and with a deep resolve to tell others that they too can find life through Jesus Christ. And it's in your name, Lord Jesus, that we pray. Amen. Worship team can come forward. It's our song of response. Sing, facing a task unfinished. We'll stand together and sing once the music begins.
Let's bow our heads again in another time of prayer and encourage you to, in silence, lift up your concerns, your joys to the Lord and trust that He hears you. He knows what we each need and He will answer our prayers according to His will. Let's pray. Lord God Almighty, You are the light who shines in the darkness. You came, Lord Jesus Christ, you took on flesh to be the light who leads lost people back to their creator, to their God. Lord, we pray for this world that is in darkness. We pray for people who wander in the darkness, who don't know you, who are seeking, but don't know where to look. We pray, Lord, that you would bring them the message of Jesus Christ. We thank you, Lord, that you are continuing to build your church. You are continuing to draw people from all nations unto yourself, uniting them through faith in Jesus Christ, one Lord over all. We pray for those who go far and wide into the darkness to proclaim the message of Jesus. We pray that you would protect them. We pray that you would protect Christians everywhere as they live out their lives for Jesus, as they tell others that Jesus Christ is their Lord, and many face persecution. Many are thrown into prison, or worse, their lives are taken because the evil one believes he can gain an advantage by killing Christians. But as the stories in Scripture remind us, Lord, the death of your people does not end or damage the church. In fact, it spurs it on. And for all Christians who lose their lives for the name of Jesus, you take them straight into glory. And so, as followers of Christ, we have nothing to fear in this world. And we do not need to fear what is to come in the next world. For we will be with you, Lord Jesus, through faith in you. What a wonderful gospel message. What a wonderful future for all who claim Jesus Christ as Lord. Lord, you are the bright morning star. We pray for those among us who are grieving, who are facing dark times because of illness, for those with failing health, Lord, those who are, whose lives are darkened by fear, would you be near them? Would you, would you let your light penetrate the darkness that they are enveloped in? We pray, Lord, that you would give each one of us strength, that we would live our lives for you, realizing that everything we have comes from you. You call us to work, to work hard, to do our best, but ultimately you are the one who provides. And as we celebrated Thanksgiving a few days ago, you are the God of providence. You provide all things for your creation. You provide all things for our physical needs. And you provide for our spiritual needs, which we've been speaking of again this morning. You do that through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Lord, we pray that you would be with our nation, our neighbors to the south, Lord, as political unrest is growing, as we near, as the U.S. nears the election, Lord, and hostilities increase, Lord, we pray that your will may be done. We pray also for our country, that you would guide our leaders. We pray, Lord, that we would trust you, for you put leaders into power, you take them out according to your will. May we look to you and trust in you, Lord, no matter what happens. Remind us that we are safe in your hands. Lord, we pray that 
as we go forth in this day and in the week ahead, that you would go with us. Protect us, we pray. As we see the weather turning, as we head into winter, Lord, with the challenges that brings and increased risk as we're on the roads and doing things, Lord, we pray that you would keep us safe. We pray, Lord, that in all that we do, we may live for you, that we might bring you honor and glory and praise through our lives, through our congregations, through the church that we are part of, that we might show this world that the kingdom of Jesus Christ has come. His kingdom cannot fail, for he is the King Almighty, the King of the universe. He is the judge of the universe, for he is the Lord over all things. May that empower us, Lord, to live for him, to live for you in all that we do. Lord, hear the prayers that are on our hearts. We lift them up to you, prayers of joy for the good you are doing in our lives, prayers of sorrow and concern because of the struggles that we're facing, that we're going through. Remind us that we can turn to you in prayer always. That we should seek you in times of prayer. Like Cornelius did, like Peter did. Seeking your will. And trusting that you, Holy Spirit, living within us will guide us. May we trust in you completely. We ask and we pray all these things. Through Jesus' most mighty and powerful name. Amen. Okay, we're going to sing another song, Cornerstone. We've been discussing that wonderful gospel message of Jesus Christ. He is the cornerstone of the church. He is our foundation. Let's stand together when the music plays and let's sing Cornerstone.
which Deacon is going to pray, I'll invite him forward. And this morning's offering is for Lethbridge Pregnancy Care Center, an agency that seeks to help women in desperate situations, wondering what to do with an unplanned pregnancy. The collection plates are on the table just outside the doors if you want to give to that cause this morning. I invite you to drop your gifts in those plates. Shall we pray? Dear Lord and Father, we thank you for today's collection for the Lethbridge Pregnancy Care Center. This facility offers these young women a renewed hope for better things to come. The staff at LPCC will walk alongside the women and men in a crisis, offer them love and support along the way. We thank you, God, our Father, for being an answer to their prayers. We pray this all in your holy name. Amen. Receive a parting benediction from our Lord and God. May the God of peace, who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, the great shepherd of the sheep, may he equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in all of us what is pleasing to him, through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Closing song, Mighty to Save.